Good afternoon. Welcome to Frontier Lab Southeast Asia monthly webinar. In today's webinar, we will be sharing about pyrolysis GCMS application for 3D printing polymers characterization. As part of today's webinar, we will be playing a recorded lecture of Professor Rigoboto Adventula, who is a senior professor at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, he is also our collaborator. Let me quickly introduce Frontier Laboratories. Frontier Laboratories is a Japanese organization located in Koryama, Fukushima Prefecture. We are into our 32nd year of journey. We are global leader in analytical pyrolysis technology. We manufacture analytical pyrolysis system and a micro reactor, single and tandem micro reactor for biomass and catalyst uh, screening uh, applications. We also produce column and other accessories for pyrolysis GCMS application. Please visit our website www.frontier-lab.com to know more about our product portfolio and applications. Let me quickly introduce pyrolysis GCMS technique. If you are using a GCMS, you can see the pyrolyzer as a sample introducing tool which allows you to analyze the solid sample directly without any sample preparation. At the same time, this pyrolyzer can be operated at high temperature, which is required for analyzing polymeric material. If you are using thermogrammetric analyzer, it is easy to understand the pyrolysis GCMS as well. In pyrolyzer, we take sample and treat the sample at different temperature. At the outlet of the furnace is connected to the GCMS to characterize the evolved gases from the sample by treating the sample at different temperature. You can always refer back to our previous uh, webinars session to know more about the pyrolysis GCMS working principle. The pyrolysis GCMS can be operated in four different analytical techniques. They are evolved gas analysis, single shot analysis, double shot analysis, and EGA hot cut GCMS. Yeah, please watch the details of these four different analytical techniques from our previous videos. Pyrolysis GCMS is used for identification of polymeric material and additives for the QC purpose. This technique can be used for structural characterization as well, and also to study the mechanism and kinetics of polymer degradation. Historically, pyrolysis GCMS has been widely used for qualitative measurements, but even quantitative analysis of additives and polymer would be possible with pyrolysis GCMS. In today's talk, we will share about the application for 3D printing and polymers characterization. As you all know, 3D printing, also known as additive manufacturing, is a method of creating a three-dimensional object layer by layer using a computer-created design. 3D printing is an additive process whereby layers of materials are built up to create a 3D part of desired design. There are a variety of 3D printing materials, including thermoplastics such as ABS, metals including powders, resins, and ceramics. Due to its unique features, 3D printing has application across a range of industries. Characterization of 3D printing materials are important to match its performance requirement for different applications. In today's talk, you will learn how pyrolysis GCMS is used for characterizing 3D printing polymers. We have published application booklets for 3D printing polymer characterization using pyrolysis GCMS. It has about 12 different applications for different objectives. The first example is characterization of polylactic acid. 
the polylactic acid uh, filament material composition is generally unknown and the presence of polylactide can influence its heat deflection temperature. Therefore, it is important to characterize this material before using in any application. Characterization using IR spectroscopy may not be sufficient for composition analysis and pro product differentiation. Here we present a world gas analysis of polylactic acid, which shows a strong peak for the polylactic acid and the average mass spectrum of the unknown sample can be matched against our reference database, which confirms the presence of uh, polylactic acid. On the right hand side, we show the thermal desorption uh, GCMS analysis of polylactic acid, which confirms the presence of the additive. And again, the average mass spectrum can be compared with our reference database of additive library and shows the presence of ergo force 168. The second example is the analysis of PDMS. PDMS is most widely used silicon based organic polymer and it's particularly known for its unusual rheological properties. PDMS is optically clear in general inert, non toxic, and non flammable. When it is cured as a rubber or adhesive, it is classified as thermoset elastomer. There is a high interest on using silicones and formulated adhesive for 3D printing. Here we show the flash pyrolysis of PDMS material, which shows the major peak of D3, demonstrating the small slicing of PDMS chain. Other minor peaks stands for the higher order of D4, D5, D6, D7, and D8, or the larger fragment of PDMS chain. So these results prove the presence of PDMS in the 3D printing porous object. Similarly, the material can be tested for the additives presence and here the thermal desorption GCMS data. Yes. So to begin with, I'm a professor at Case Western Reserve University. This is a comprehensive major research university in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, in a nice summer day, it looks like this, although uh, winter months, uh, you can imagine everything with blanketed with snow. But it's a cultural center. We have the Cleveland Museum of Art the famous Cleveland Orchestra, and uh, we are a city by the lake, Lake Erie. Now, uh, Case Western is also the home of Thinkbox, one of the first makerspace additive manufacturing 3D printing uh, laboratories located in a major university. And it is very accessible to our students, but more so uh, open to the public as well as faculty doing research in 3D printing. Uh, my department, I'm with uh, the Macromolecular Science Engineering Department, that is polymers or plastics for short. We specialize on materials that end up in paints, plastic packaging, uh, coatings, uh, and even 3D printing. Uh, some of my research uh, work uh, uh, are very basic, and as you can see here, a collage of the different research areas uh, we have contributed uh, in interfacial chemistry, patterning, uh, detection methods, surface analytical methods, uh, and nanomaterials as well. On the other hand, uh, as a group, we are very versed in working with industry. We like to use uh, the platform, the best basic platforms that the university can offer uh, to help solve problems, uh, offer new technologies, and uh, provide a cost performance ratio benefit uh, to the companies that we work with. And uh, as you can see here, uh, we look at a bridge uh, based on applied science or what we call engineering to link up with the market. And of course, working with a company or an industrial problem or even a startup company allows us to take this basic platform and productize it or solve problems uh, which can improve efficiency. After all, it is all about performance and cost ratio. 
and of course somebody willing to pay for that work. Now, uh, in our case, uh, we have a complete laboratory, as you can see here, uh, for doing a lot of polymer analysis, uh, rheology. Uh, specifically, we have a lot of thin film coating methods, uh, uh, even fabrication methods, spectroscopy, microscopy, as well as, as, as has been introduced to you recently by Rogene. Capabilities now together with Frontier Labs and quantum analytics to do GC mass spec pyrolysis. Uh, in, in fact, uh, we organize a number of conferences. The nearest one will be uh, the Advanced, Advanced Coatings Conference on May and also a 3D printing conference in October this year. Uh, you can take note of the websites and get more information. Both conferences are in partnership with uh, Frontier Labs and Quantum Analytics as uh, sponsors. Now, let me tell you more about coatings and uh, uh, its impact in terms of packaging, uh, consumer electronics, automotive finishing. Although I will not be able to talk much about coatings in general today because that is a separate topic, I can tell you, of course, a gamut of projects we have done in the past where uh, trying to improve the structure property relationship or looking at new function that can be improved let's say by nanostructuring or super uh, properties allow us to be at the frontier of materials development as well as improving property of uh, products and all of this means that we have to be versed with the chemistry, interfacial chemistry in particular, with a number of these coating applications. For example, we look at nanostructuring at the layer by layer level, uh, which means we can apply chemical adsorption or physical adsorption to modify properties and layers. Uh, we we have developed a number of techniques involving polyelectrolyte modification or even the use of polymer brushes. Polymer brushes allow us to graft polymers covalently on surfaces as well as improve their wetting behavior. On the other hand, our group has con contributed a lot in the area of organic electronics or sometimes more familiar to you as OLED display devices that is found in your Samsung uh, let's say, uh, smartphones. After all, this is all about polymer science. Polymers, as you uh, most commonly know as plastics, really goes beyond the term plastics. This comprises the chemistry that is involved in thermosets and elastomers, or commonly known as epoxy or paint or rubber or uh, different formulations that goes into shampoo, personal care, and other consumer products. What the control of polymer interface and colloidal science does is it enables us to nanostructure their function on surfaces as coatings or membranes or as additives that eventually goes to your uh, shampoo or, or um, medicine by controlling the interaction as a colloidal particle. That means that this type of study or optimization brings us at par with control of other nanomaterials as shown on the right. And that brings us a segue uh, to using nanomaterials such as carbon nanotubes, graphite dots, nanocellulose, uh, together with polymer science to improve many types of material properties. Now, key to some of our experiments is determining the composition, the structure property relationship of the materials that we develop. Uh, shown on the left are some of the more recognizable consumer products uh, or in particular industrial applications, plastics, inks, rubber, coatings, composites, adhesives, lubricants, chemical additives, surfactants, and formulation. This collage of uh, 
uh, or list of rather consumer products actually is based on formulation or blending science. So many of the industrial and consumer applications we have are actually mixtures or blends of many compo uh, compositions. That is why GC mass spec pyrolysis is so important uh, in things like reverse engineering or understanding failure of products or even trying to understand how certain additives or compositions are applied and therefore synergistically enhance performance. Mm -hmm. And the techniques that was uh, featured and described by uh, Rogin uh, uh, using the pyrolysis GC mass spec of Frontier Labs uh, together with very good uh, uh, GC mass spec instrumentation allows a very keen, a very uh, smart uh, analytical chemist to do a lot of this analysis and contribute to the development of these products. So in shortness of time, I will not be able to uh, explain many things and coatings and composites that we actually do uh, together with uh, these techniques, but rather I'll just focus today on a very interesting and of course uh, uh, hot topic in the area of 3D printing, which in this case you will learn more about 3D printing today, as well as some of the applications we have used with GC mass spec pyrolysis to analyze some of the commercial polymers that we 3D printed. Um, so uh, to begin with, let me introduce to you 3D printing uh, as a perspective. Back in 2016, I was invited by the World Economic Forum uh, to give a perspective on the future of 3D printing. 3D printing today uh, is part of manufacturing, prototyping, but the perspective of the growth of 3D printing is that plastics, polymers, ceramics can play an important role in robotics, soft robotics, automotive, aerospace, and in the future, of course, uh, to outer space or inner space bio-inspired design, and of course, biomedical applications. And vital to this is the use of the right materials together with the appropriate design. The combination of the two makes 3D printing uh, the uh, manufacturing mode of the future and industry 4.0. Now today, one can buy, buy a commercial 3D printer uh, even a hobbyist 3D printer, such as on the left, costing anywhere from several hundred thousand to a thousand dollars, or the use of, let's say, carbon technology for fast 3D printing and even high uh, output, high throughput 3D printing. Uh, I will introduce uh, these methods to you in summary so you can have an appreciation of the different uses and scale. But what I actually like about 3D printing is that that we can be inspired by nature or biomimetically we can copy nature and in fact there's a growing movement of taking what is present and available in nature to design new mechanical and thermic mechanical uses that goes into the design of functions for robotics for furniture for architectural uh, implements and so on another is that uh, 3D printing allows us to go from micro to nano resolution. In fact, my introduction with 3D printing more than uh, 20 years ago was actually based on stereolithography using two photon polymerization. And as you can see here, 3D printing goes to the scale where you need a microscope, a stereo microscope, or even um, SEM to uh, uh, see the fine details that can be done by stereolithography 3D printing. Another case is the growing uh, need for prosthesis devices or methods of uh, making them via 3D printing. One can take advantage of the new developments in imaging, simulation, for example, to copy and mimic the exact design of the human body or be more specific with the patient or personal medicine. Uh, several things that are commercially produced these days, 3D printing is used in the dental industry, 
uh, in the uh, prosthesis devices as well as hearing aids. And for example, uh, 3D printing allows one to change the design uh, of the infill or the uh, bone density, for example, when one is trying to replace bone, which is different from the craniomaxofacial surgery requirements all the way to orthopedic designs. Uh, of course, 3D printing goes also into manufacturing of cars. Uh, this is the uh, one of the first cars uh, that was demonstrated here at Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, where they're able to make new designs or re resurrect old designs such as the Cobra based on 3D printing alone or lightweighting of automotive engines, aerospace, etc. So what I've been driving at to this point is that 3D printing is advantageous because it allows complexity uh, together with materials design to improve uh, function and also the economics of production. And so here is a summary of the different 3D printing methods from uh, SLA based on lithography or photopolymerization to fuse deposition modeling, which is used to 3D print plastic by melt extrusion, uh, and even analysis of metals and uh, use of metals and ceramics for printing. Uh, here is a list of what is 3D printable, uh, from metals to different polymeric materials, ceramic materials, and even organic materials, or even food. And that means there's a rich plethora of analytical methods that will be needed to optimize these materials that will be used for 3D printing. Not only to optimize materials, but failure analysis. One of the things that we have uh, used as a goal in our own projects and facility is to understand why some materials work and why some materials are better. And that means by stress, seeing these materials to testing, one can then or use analytical methods to understand what are uh, the modes that resulted into a materials failure as well. Now, polymer science, for those of you who would like to know the properties of plastics, uh, really is a hierarchy of properties. What we know as polyethylene, which Regine uh, uh, showed very well in terms of analysis, are, are commodity polymers that form the base of this pyramid. So polyethylene, of course, uh, is derived from uh, petroleum products. On the other hand, the um, peak, PAEC, and other high-performance polymers form the apex of this pyramid, are based mostly on condensation polymers. Uh, here is a Ashby-like type of diagram which shows that the cost and the tensile strength can be a combination of uh, poly, uh, thermoplastic polymers versus that of thermosets. Thermosets will be your epoxy, your polyimide, phenolic, and uh, polyester resins. That means at the right combination of processing and price, one can obtain the optimum strength and price ratio. And here is a collage of the possible applications of 3D printing in various industries, from marine to aerospace, consumer, and electronics. Now, nanomaterials can come in many forms, and a number of them are widely commercially available. Carbon nanotubes, graphene, nanoclays, metal oxides, nanofibers, cellulose nanofibers. It may interest you to know that a number of products today contain nanomaterials, even though they are not widely classified as nanomaterials, but as chemical additives. GC mass spec pyrolysis is interesting in that it allows you to analyze not only the volatile additives, the polymer themselves, but you can look at insoluble derivatives. Nevertheless, uh, both carbon-based and non-carbon-based, organic and inorganic, can be distinguished in most cases by a combination of GC mass spec pyrolysis, NMR, and X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy.
Of course, GC mass spec pyrolysis offers a way of exactly identifying the components, both on the organic polymer side and some of the charred uh, components, let's say based on graphene and uh, POS or silica-based type of components. Uh, graphene, for example, is of a high interest to us because this combination of graphene and graphene oxide are, are, have been shown to have good mechanical properties as well as antibacterial properties. Uh, here is a summary of the 3D printing projects we have done uh, through the years from polyurethanes to rubber to acrylate polymers, silicon composites, the use of nanocellulose and composites, and the 3D printing of high performance polymers such as PIC and PPS. So with the remaining time I have, I will show you two projects where we have applied uh, GC mass spec pyrolysis, in fact, to analyze what we have or what uh, properties uh, that we can synergistically match with the composition and the performance that we observe. So rubber, for example, can be classified uh, in many ways, natural rubber or synthetic rubber, elastomeric, thermoplastic elastomeric rubber, or thermoset elastomeric rubber. And some of you are familiar with the classification or acronyms of uh, these materials from SBR to SBM to EPDM. I will not, of course, be giving uh, a review of ru uh, rubber, but rather focus on one elastomer that we use. We investigated the use of polyurethane thermoplastic elastomers based on isocyanate and polyol chemistry. So just a short review based on this diagram shows that a typical polyurethane will be made from a hard and soft segment that is afforded by the use of a polyol or a isocyanate that can be your hard segment the polyol produces the amorphous character and the hard segment, uh, the crystalline ca character based on the use of TDI, MDI, and other types of applications. Moreover, more, most plastics usually contain uh, plasticizers to enhance their processability. Uh, and so the question is, can we analyze polyurethane that is used for 3D printing using GC mass spec pyrolysis? As you can see here, uh, TPU and other uh, polyurethane-based elastomers or even thermoset uh, uh, elastomer-based reactions are very important industrially. They can be found in a lot of car parts, engineering parts, machine parts, etc. On the other hand, TPU is also a very important biomedical grade material that can be used in a number of implants, prosthesis devices, artificial heart or even resins for dialysis. Uh, so this project, in particular project, we have used the combination of graphene oxide as a reinforcing material in thermoplastic polyurethane. We first prepared the graphene oxide and thermoplastic polyurethane together with the polylactic acid compatibilizer by solution method. This allows us to prepare a very homogeneous mixture, which we can then um, evaporate the solvent and end up with a plastic material, a polymer material that we can prepare a filament. To verify the presence of graphene oxide, we use a technique called Raman spectroscopy uh, to look at the D and G bands of the graphene and the oxidation state that it was used in the mixture. So after preparing this mixture, evaporating the solvent, and then doing an extrusion to prepare the filament, we then 3D printed these devices. And as you can see here, various forms of elastomeric property is confirmed. The color is black because of the graphene oxide loading. We were able to then test the different uh, amounts of graphene oxide and its material properties. So graphene oxide then should enhance the property, the thermomechanical properties, and 
the orientation of 3D printing or 3D printability is an important parameter because uh, 3D printing is a layering technique, an additive layering technique. Therefore, the direction of printing parallel or perpendicular to the bed makes a difference. This was exhibited when we tested the uh, material for compression modulus, showing that the S and L compression or the parallel versus perpendicular are two different uh, uh, thermomechanical pro properties. Moreover, the tensile strength, uh, tensile uh, properties uh, are very different too, depending on the direction as shown as in the row curves. In fact, the L specimen improved the compression modulus by 56%. The S specimen produced an uh, improvement of 167%. And overall, the addition of graphene oxide improved the performance of the 3D printed material. The tensile stress uh, measurement or tensile modulus measurements, in fact, showed that at 0.5 weight percent of graphene oxide, we obtained an optimum tensile modulus property, not the 5 weight percent, mind you. What this implies is that the nanostructuring, even at a smaller amount, of graphene oxide actually makes a difference in terms of the graphene oxide synergistic property. Moreover, these 3D printed materials are biocompatible as shown by this NIH 3T3 cells or fibroblast cells that were easily grown on all the 3D printed uh, materials with up to five weight percent graphene oxide. So you may ask what Pyrolysis GC mass spec uh, contributed to this project. Well, we use all of the materials, the graphene oxide, the PLA, uh, the solvent with known compositions uh, and some we synthesize ourselves. So we definitely know the composition, we know uh, the structure. But what is unknown to us was the polyurethane. We use a commercial polyurethane sample, uh, which we have no idea on its composition. Uh, and as, as shown you, it produced very interesting results. Yet, if we try to publish uh, such a work, uh, we'll be reporting only a commercially available uh, uh, material lessens its impact. So in this case, GC mass spec pyrolysis was a key technique for us to evaluate this commercial sample. And as introduced by Rajin, one can start with uh, evolved gas analysis or EGA uh, to look at the various compositions on the material. We can then uh, use a combination of single shot or double shot or hard cut to analyze any additives uh, the uh, different uh, compositions of the polymer itself. So it's very interesting that the polyurethane, of course, uh, can have a combination of TDI, MDI, or aromatic or non-aromatic isocyanates. So you may ask, is IR capable of analyzing those things? The answer is no. TGA, IR is not sufficient to analyze those things. Can we use NMR? Uh, to analyze those different compositions. Yes, perhaps you can, but you have to do a lot of separation techniques to get to the bottom of the composition. In this case, a combination of EGA, and again, the appropriate techniques uh, uh, after EGA allowed us to get the answers that we need. And again, a review here is that the EGA is the first step in this analysis of the 3D printed sample itself or the polymer uh, we use itself, followed by either using the single shot or double shot to distinguish the additives from the polymer and then to analyze the polymer composition alone. Or we can do hard cutting, dividing the EGA to specific zones to get a further handle on the composition. And as you can see here, the F search engine is a very easy tool to look at a library of possible compositions without going through a specific analysis uh, based on the uh, mass ion peak uh, or or, or uh, the different uh, components based on the major fragmentation structures 
of the material. So to begin with, the EGA thermogram of the polymer looks like the plot on the left. That means most degradation have taken place by the time you reach 600 to 700 degrees C. So uh, several major peaks there are of interest on the thermogram. We then did a flash pyrolysis uh, just to verify the presence of the major compositions that are found uh, in the material. And what you can see here is we did indeed found poly oil compositions of the polyurethane. In particular, butane diol is present. Uh, we did observe the presence of dibutyl phthalate. And this is, of course, of high interest because the commercial polyurethane has to be processed and therefore they have to add plasticizers. And uh, as you can see here, we even have a handle on the uh, um, isocyanates that were used. But more specifically, by doing a technique called hard cutting, we can divide the zones, uh, zone A, B, C, and D. Uh, A revealed as the presence, again, of the phthalate. Zone B uh, revealed as the presence of the poly, uh, some of the butane diol as well as the uh, MDI. So to review, if you look at the EGA, uh, we divided zone A, zone B, zone C, and zone D in increasing temperature as well as windows. There are different windows. So zone C confirmed the presence again of uh, the THF, uh, butoxybutanol. Uh, these are components of the uh, different polyols, as you can see, a mixture of them. On the other hand, uh, the zone D confirmed as well the presence of these different fractions. So all of this was done with F-Search. And at this point, we have actually done a complete analysis of the polymer and even the presence of phthalates on that commercial polyurethane that we use. Now, uh, on the remaining time I have, I have uh, going to show you uh, one way we have transformed this polyurethane into foam. Now, you may ask, why is this of interest? Polyurethane is processed as a plastic. However, polyurethane is actually well known as a foam. Matter of fact, I'm sitting on a polyurethane foam right now, and probably you are if you're uh, using a cushion or came uh, with a automo with your automotive uh, seat. It's usually based on polyurethane. We took an unconventional route to produce a foam by converting a thermoplastic polyurethane produced by 3D printing and then softening it. The way the printing was done, this case was not by FDM, but by a technique called viscoelastic paste extrusion printing. Basically, we prepared a paste and then 3D printed it by syringe extraction. Pretty much, this is how you would 3D print ketchup, or this is how you would 3D print cement, or this is how you would 3D print chocolate. And that means you pay attention to the viscosity of the material and also its curability. So in this case, we prepared a paste of the, the same polyurethane that we just analyzed. We added clay, we added some solvent. The clay was actually a rheology modifier, but as I'll show you later, it was key towards producing an interesting foam property. 3D printing allows us to control the material as well as the design. Rheology is very important because of the viscosity parameter. I will reserve that discussion in another time. But suffice it to say, we look at the shear thinning properties based on sufficient yield stress and storage modulus. The result is we were able to 3D print these samples, uh, these grids with different opening. And at the same time, by leaching or removing the nanoclay using hydrofluoric acid etching, we were able to produce a very different material property of the same design. So the correlation of the grid size and the material property by removal of the nanoclay produce a very porous nature. Open cell nature, as you can see, 
on the 3D printed material. So you can see the picture above of the 3D printed material after uh, this HF treatment, and this resulted in very dramatic changes in properties. Uh, we can characterize or correlate the compression modulus based on opening size, the compression modulus based on the ratio of the nanoclay and the material. And it pretty much track uh, the opening as well as the nanoclay. Uh, the simple trend is the higher the opening, the lower, uh, the higher the compression modulus rather. And then the higher the ratio of nanoclay, the higher the compression modulus. So other than giving those numbers, probably the, it's better to show you a movie of those properties. So as we 3D print these materials, you can see that they're very hard to compress uh, with a smaller opening. However, with a larger opening based on 3D printing, you can see that we can compress them uh, somewhat or bend them. And you can see the comparison between A and B. Now the dramatic transformation is when we remove the nanoclay and produce porosity on these materials. So from A, it was transformed to C. Okay, so the same plastic material then became a foam. From B to D, different ratio. So you can see a different compressibility. So all of this would have been possible because we use TPU that uh, we obtained commercially. However, the value of the TPU just became very important because GC mass spec pyrolysis allowed us to understand and analyze the composition prior to using them for 3D printing. Now let me skip this too in the interest of time and give you the last example. The last example, we actually use silicone. Silicone, elastomer, and adhesive. Silicone is an important class of polymer that is used for seals, adhesives, bioimplants, uh, different elastomeric components. We were actually interested in this silicone adhesive, a $6 product that you can buy from Home Depot. Some of you probably use it to caulk or to use for uh, DIY projects at home. And I'll show you that this is a very interesting 3D printing material. Uh, silicon elastomers are processed as rubbers. It can be based on LSR or low consistency elastomer and of course adhesives. So using uh, a different viscous solution printing method, we basically connected the uh, syringe, filled it up with this DAP adhesive, and then used a regular Ultimaker 3D printer to produce a 3D printed part. So in this case, we started by doing an EGA analysis of the commercially available DAP adhesive. Again, we found the dibutyl talate but majority of the composition is simply the silicone itself. This is akin to reverse engineering of that commercial sample. Uh, and of course, uh, we could have applied other methods, but just to show you that by F-Search library alone of the thermogram, uh, by flash pyrolysis, uh, we can definitely confirm the presence of the silicone EDMS material or polydimethyl siloxane. And the various oligomers or fragments confirm this based on the mass spectral analysis of the individual peaks. And of course, to do a reverse engineering, then we will look at other types of additives that went into the silicone. And of course, for, for proprietary reasons, I will not go uh, to those, some of those results. Again, uh, going to the, uh, back to the importance of viscosity, we took this now analyzed commercially available silicone, 3D printed it, optimized it by comparing the distance between the surface, the opening, the uh, pressure from the syringe and the optimum viscosity. The bottom line is this is a very viable 3D printable material. The result, 
is we 3D printed them with various opening sizes of the tip. You can see the quality, the higher resolution with the narrower tip. All of this is based on that commercially available DAP material, $6 from Home Depot. We can make very high resolution printing and I can even make our very own silicone tennis ball. Uh, and lastly, we have played around with a technique called SLA to 3D print a silicone material based on a acrylate derivative. We can 3D print them using this technique. This is based on photopolymerization, a combination of the acrylate monomers, die cross linkers, and initiators that we use. And we can 3D print objects like this and this. The 15% silicon polymer loading actually gave it a different elastomeric behavior versus a monolith. Uh, for lack of time, uh, I will not be able to show you the results we have. We can basically reverse engineer the resin, that commercial resin that we use for 3D printing, as well as confirm the presence of other additives that were used on this project. Again, by doing so, we dramatically improve the impact factor of our work. Instead of just reporting a commercial sample, we can actually report what was used in that commercial sample. Uh, and I will skip this last part. Uh, this simply shows that we have used graphene oxide as a nanomaterial to improve this SLA 3D printed part. Uh, we have another project right now on using GC mass spec pyrolysis to analyze the presence of graphene oxide and its role in 3D printing and coatings as well. So I'm ready to conclude. Uh, what we have done and what I've tried to show to you is 3D printing and polymers as the future of additive advanced manufacturing. Most commodity polymers used for 3D printing are commodity plastics. I've shown a differentiation between what an elastomer, a thermoplastic, and a thermoset will be. I hope I've convinced you that in this case, GC mass spec pyrolysis was very important for our projects because it enabled us to analyze some of the commercial samples we use uh, in these projects that have been published, reported. Is the uh, right use of the techniques allows us basically to reverse engineer, quote unquote, these materials for our own purpose. Uh, and in the future, uh, you may of course contact me and ask more questions about our work on 3D printing, as well as other projects in coatings, adhesives, and so on. So with that, I'd like to thank you again, our audience, and of course, give back the table to uh, Lauren uh, 